Okay, I'll go first. Um, Aloha, uh, mahalo for joining us tonight. Uh, we want to remind folks that the musical albums Le Na Hono Pi'ilani, Songs of West Maui, and Le Na Hono Pi'ilani Na Mele Ho um, are available for purchase at mele.com and also digitally. And the songbook, um, also of the same name, Le Na Hono Pi'ilani, distributed by Kamehameha Publishing, is also available at their website for purchase. All proceeds from the albums and the book go to support Na Leo Ka Lele, the West Maui Kayapuni Community Organization. Uh, mahalo and enjoy the evening. Mahalo everyone for joining us this evening. Happy Pepe Lewali everyone. Uh, since 2018, the Ikane o Maui Culture Center has been hosting the Free Public HK West Maui Community Fund uh, Kanaka Scholar Series Lecture. Um, this series is co-sponsored by HK West Maui Community Fund, also the <clears throat> University of Hawaii Maui College, uh, Hawaiian Studies Department, and the Kue Petition Hui. And lectures are um, usually monthly. The series features a host of new and established scholars, also innovators, and their research and their work on um, Hawaii and the Hawaiian communities. We proudly present this to you via Zoom Live through HK West Maui's Facebook page tonight. Uh, tonight's presentation, different attitudes surrounding Olelo Hawaii. Uh, Ha'alilio Solomon is an instructor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa at the Hala Olelo Hawaii or Hawaii Huelani Center for Hawaiian Language. Um, Solomon is pursuing his doctoral degree in linguistics. Um, he is the president of Ahui Olelo Hawaii an organization dedicated to the perpetuation of the Hawaiian language. And it is Hawaiian Language Month, everybody. <laughs> um, Solomon uh, served as the live interpreter at a recent Hawaii con uh, conservation conference. And he speaks several other languages and researches language documentation and revitalization, as well as linguistic ideologies and attitudes surrounding all of Hawaii. And we'd like to give him a virtual round of applause and mahalo him for coming tonight. Um, Ha'alilio Solomon, aloha. Mahalo e kanali, mahalo nui. E ku ohana, e umau pilipana, o umau hoa makamaka. Ame na launa ho, o ke ya ahi ahi, e ako akua mai nei, mai hawa e a ni ihau, a puni kahonua. Aloha kako a Pauloa, aloha kako a nui loa. Uh, o no Molokai ko umakua kane, no Ahunei ko umakua hine, hanau iau o no Aha Alilio Salomon ma Honolulu nei. Mahalo everyone for joining us this evening. Aloha to everyone out there in different parts of Hawaii and maybe even different parts of the globe. Um, my name is Noah Ha'alilio Solomon. Mahalo for that intro. Um, first, I want to say thank you to uh, Bianca, Lance, and Kanani, as well as um, the West Maui Community Fund, La Ikani O Maui Cultural Center, UH Maui's Hawaiian Studies Department, and uh, um, the rest, all of the other organizers for this lecture series for having me tonight. I've been preparing a lot. I have a lot to cover. So I guess, should I start sharing my screen now? Yeah, please. Okay. <clears throat> okay, share. Present. So as Karani said, my talk is the talk tonight is called Different Attitudes Surrounding Olala Hawaii. There is a lot to get through. I um, wanna say mahalo to the organizers again. Uh, I was invited to and, and asked to talk about my, really my research focus and my dissertation studies because this is part of my uh, PhD. This is actually the bulk of my PhD. And so I wanna share a little bit how I got interested into these, interested in these, um, research topics. It was probably about 20, 2013 or so around there when I was first asked to um, 
be a translator for a court proceeding and the defendant requested an Olalo Hawaii speaker. And actually the first one I ever did, I haven't done too many, but maybe a dozen or so. Um, but the first one I did was telling and, um, and it was a sort of foreshadow of what I would come to study. Also, I wanna acknowledge that like Kanani said, it's Mahina Olalo Hawaii, Pepeluali, February is Hawaiian language month and it's both fitting that we're having this conversation now, but at the same time, it's there's a poignant irony in this whole thing to be doing to be having this particular conversation uh, in English during February uh, in this current political, social, political climate. So, anyways, uh, back to my first time in court as an interpreter. Uh, it happened. It just so happened that the, the case that was being heard right before us was a uh, case that the defendant had asked for a Tagalog interpreter for. And so um, I, I witnessed that and it just worked. It sort of, it went off without a hitch. It was over in five minutes. It, the judge delivered his, um, his, he made his decisions and that was that, you know, it was business as usual. And even though I had been kind of tipped off going into this thing you know, my, a few of my colleagues and friends had said, you know, you might have some, you might have an interesting experience being an interpreter for Olalo Hawaii uh, in court. So I was made privy to this type of situation, but it really wasn't what I was expecting. I wasn't even the defendant. I wasn't on the stand. I wasn't, uh, I was just the interpreter. And I just felt so um, scrutinized. And um, it was clear to me that Tagalog or any other language that isn't necessarily, well, in this case, is not recognized as an official language of Hawaii received this certain treatment. Whereas Olalo Hawaii, a co-official language of Hawaii as of 1978 in the Constitutional Convention, had, there was a double standard and it was clear to, it was glaring to me and so that got me really thinking on these, this idea of the different attitudes and how, fe how people really feel when we're talking about Olelo Hawaii in, in, um, in that sort of context. Where does it belong? Where does it not belong? Who should speak it? Who should not speak it? All those kinds of questions that I'll come back to uh, repeatedly throughout the next hour. But um, it even overlapped this kind of uh, idea I found to overlap in my, um, even in my own, own Ohana, sometimes my, my cousins would call and you know, my voicemail is in Hawaiian language and I'll get that sort of like joking, sassy kind of, oh, sorry, yeah, I, didn't, I don't know what you said, but call me back. Um, and it's in jest, you know, they mean it humorously and, um, and it's all in good fun, but there is something I think to unpack there. And also this notion of a heritage language if Olalo Hawaii is, has been revitalized and reclaimed as a heritage language, then who is, for whom is it a heritage language? So all in these contexts of revitalization and reclamation, you know, we're 40 years into the, the movement and a very successful movement at that. My question or questions became, um, what kind of attitudes and ide ideologies are thwarting the progress that we already made, the progress that we're in the course of making, and the, the progress that we hope to achieve in the future? So that sort of grounds my research. But first of all, we want to, of course, define what a language attitude or formally it's probably called a linguistic ideology. We want to define what that is. So uh, Michael Silverstein in 1979 said it, uh, a set of beliefs about language articulated by users as a rationalization or justification of perceived structure and language use. But I think this is sort of limited even, we can expand this even more because for the case of Olalo Hawaii, that set of beliefs about language is being articulated by users, but also by people who don't identify as users. It's being shaped and formed by people who are speakers who would consider themselves as speakers and also people who, who would not. 
and we'll get into that sort of bold and blurry at the same time line between speakership um, in the next few slides. But uh, this is where, this is sort of the theoretical framework that I'm um, proceeding with. So <clears throat> part of telling this whole story is uncovering the historical narrative. And that historical narrative is, as we all are very well aware, um, language shift in Hawaii. And my methodology to bring out, to uncover this history was to look at primary source documents, all of which, or at least most, well, I'm gonna say all, were um, in Hawaiian language. And they come from online open source archives, such as Papakilo database. Myself and two friends, peers, colleagues to whom I look up and I admire greatly. Uh, we've been translating a bulk of these articles that we've sort of handpicked and taken a fine comb in, in this archive and hand selected relevant articles or at least material or, or primary sources that we think are, are useful in uncovering this history. And we were sort of surprised to find that the shift begins in the middle of the 19th century, as early as 1850s. There is talk of English is, English is, is uh, encroaching on where Hawaiian used to be spoken and still is, but we should be careful. And it's also showing that this shift is overlapping several domains of society. Of course, we see it in the social domain. Of course, we see it also in the educational but also it's sort of trickling down from the political realm. It's emanating out from the economic realm and it's sort of encompassing this kind of pervasive ideological realm as well. And this shift, as we know, continues throughout the 20th century and is arguably still continuing today. Luckily, we've managed to reverse a lot of that, of that shift uh, successfully, but it is a, an uphill battle, right? And I want to identify the language shift historically because I know that it's, it's sort of a chicken or the egg kind of question. The shift was uh, sort of came up, it emanates from the uh, certain language attitudes and ideologies that were in place already. But then a further shift is also going to sort of cyclically, recursively also create more attitudes or deepen the attitudes that are already existing. And um, it works in this sort of cyclical way. So the shift is what's determining and has always determined and will always determine the, these ongoing ideologies. And those two sort of work together. So um, some really, really fascinating finds from the newspapers in 1854. There's this social pressure from an article called Nokia o Aneka Olelo Haole o Nakeiki Hawaii, uh, English language instruction of uh, Hawaiian children. And in this article, it says parents in Hawaiian, of course, it says parents send your children to English language schools because it is the wish of our Ali'i, who at the time was, of course, Koi Keoli Kamehameha III. Uh, he was the same one that said, Heopuni Palapala Ko'u, my nation is one of literacy. But um, to see the, the language shift that early was uh, a new dimension of the, the research to me. And um, we, to, we can't decontextualize this article, for example, or articles that are similar. When Kaui Keoli was, uh, on, was the head of the, the, the nation, Hawaiian was not nearly in um, any, not even threatened by, by any uh, stretch, but it was interesting to see this sort of these first indications of language shift in 1854. And then four years later, we see this sort of educational reform kind of happening. We're already the Board of Education, this Palapala Ho'ike Makahike, this is a yearly report, an annual report by the president of the Board of Education in 1858. 
And in this article, a few paragraphs down, it says the Board of Education is considering, is considering decreasing funding for Hawaiian schools and increasing it for English schools. Um, this is an issue that particularly Hawaii, uh, we've been uh, struggling with in public school education. And to see this dated as early as 1858 was uh, uh, a valuable inclusion in my research. Then the following year, in 1859, we see uh, section, eight, uh, section 1493 of the Civil Code demands that English take precedence. English language takes priority. If the English language version and the Hawaiian language version differ in any part of the Civil Code, the English version shall be held as correct, and that is the law. This is stated in Kahai Hawaii, August 31st, 1859 in the Civil Code. Um, and lastly, there's this perception of English prestige that we can already kind of recognize in 1878. It says the assumption that English is all pure and good, void of expletives or filled with speech that is vulgar, embarrassing and inappropriate to be uttered or heard the way Hawaiian is, of course, you know, filled with expletives and vulgar. So we see this sort of seeds kind of being scattered for um, different perceptions and different attitudes forming around English, a different set of attitudes forming around Hawaiian when they're sort of juxtaposed or mutually compared. Um, and of course, in, I don't think I put a date on this, but this is the 1897 legislation that passed Act 57, which uh, Ruben Fernandez Asensio in his uh, journal last uh, 2019, he called Act 57, not the bullet that killed Hawaiian education, but its tombstone. And Act 57 was the act that said, English language must be the primary language of any public education. In other words, if any school, if any public school wants to get funded from the government, they must be operating in English. Um, and that finality of 1896-1897 when the act when Act 57 is um, happening is being implemented, it sort of has an immediate sort of impact. And that impact is there's a certain finiteness that that accompanies that. And uh, this article that says all schools have turned en masse to using only the English language while instruction in the mother tongue is completely lacking. I might even revise this translation of completely lacking. Basically it says it has disappeared. There is no, there's no more instruction in public schools that's happening in or even about Hawaiian language. It is entirely English. So these four decades sort of precipitate to, um, into a, a massive shift, at least in the educational realms and political realms. And of course, those are affecting the social realms and the sort of ideological um, uh, attitudes around Hawaiian language that people have at the time. But that's not to say that there were not warnings against language shift. Those were as plentiful as the indications that language was shifting. There were also these sort of beautiful emotional pleas to save our language. And this actually was of an emotional um, six months of translation of this block of articles and primary sources because of that reason. Um, and these are really beautiful, poetic, candid sorts of um, entreatments. Please hold on to our language, like this headline. How is the life of the Hawaiian language to live, to continue on? Um, will instruction of the Hawaiian language in Hawaiian schools cease to exist, therefore teaching English only? Another headline is, um, will the Hawaiian language continue? And this interesting sort of uh, dimension. 
meaning we must prize the, prof the vocation, the profession of a school teacher because it's what we need. And that article in particular was saying that Hawaiian teachers or at least Kama'aina teachers, Kama'aina born, locally born teachers are much better suited to educate our children. Because at the time, even in the, the late 19th century, they were already bringing American teachers. So um, in this, the whole sort of shakedown of all of this, it's pretty clear that there are several examples of this really discouraging kind of language around people, the fact that people are witnessing the, the language shift is happening away from Olelo Hawaii towards English and they're reacting to that. And you see words like ho'ohepa, which means to corrupt. Pahemahema, which means, you know, erroneous, clumsy, or um, inaccurate. So there's this notion of elders criticizing the younger and up and coming generations for their, I wouldn't even say incompetence, they're just not as good as the, the parent or grandparent generation when speaking Olaru Hawaii. There's this word po'opalaleha, Ho'opalaleha, I think, is sort of the modern equivalent and English language equivalent of benign neglect. Ho'opalaleha means to neglect and almost to turn a blind eye. And um, that's identified as one of the leading causes of language shift. We are too much ho'opalaleha. We're neglecting it. And it's mina mina. It's a shame that Hawaiian language is being poina. It's being forgotten. And then there's this article in uh, uh, on language and discourse about ho'okai or mistreatment, prejudice. You, some people even say they stretch it as far as meaning uh, discrimination, that um, Hawaiian speakers are not, Hawaiian speakers are shown discrimination and prejudice and even Hawaiian people because we are bringing in uh, teachers from outside of Hawaii as if they, can teach our keiki better. And by then, by the 1880s, I would say, English is known as, uh, and sort of touted and celebrated in headlines in the newspapers as an olelo alaka'i. It's a leading language and it's also a global language. I mean, over a century ago, English is already dominating, at least to the extent that it's being recognized as that by Hawaiians. Of the, of the late 19th century. So um, these are examples of those words that I, I pulled, I find really flavorful. I think these words are really um, sharp and pointed in terms of um, reacting to the language shift. So um, I realized it kind of gelled over really quickly I think I'm moving kind of fast, Kalamai. But um, that was sort of the 19th century, uh, a brief look at language shift in terms of how it was indicated in public discourse in the 19th century, the last, at least the latter half of it. Um, I really, I realized I went through the 1890s really, really quickly and really only acknowledged Act 57. Um, but also part of my research is really kind of getting at the, what's unseen and what's not really talked about on paper um, and at what doesn't become policy because Act 57 clearly became policy, but I'm equally interested in sort of reading between the lines and what does that mean in terms of uh, the impact it had. So let's fast forward a little bit. We're in the 20th century now. And um, this 1933 article that says, we might not regret this language loss at this time, but we certainly will regret it in the future. I'm also blaming myself for this as my children do not speak the Hawaiian language. This is from a male who was admitting in his article, I speak, Olero Hawaii with my vahine, but we do not speak to our children. So we are as much to blame for this language shift. 
So we see this interpersonal struggle. They're blaming, we have this person blaming himself. And then a really interesting thread in this whole fabric, in this whole research, this dimension of non-ethnic Hawaiians being interested in learning Olala Hawaii and they are doing it as early as 1940s. And you know, where the particular way Hawaii was embroiled in World War II, um, there's actually another article that was saying that the gist of it was saying, will Hawaiian language survive after World War II? So there's a dynamic time happening in the, 1940, the early 1940s. Um, this one article that said, there are others who greatly prize, others meaning non-Hawaiians, greatly prize our grandparents' language who have therefore attempted to speak it, determined in their pursuit of fluency in speaking our language. Uh, in the, say, the following year, there are many people of other races starting to learn and become proficient in the Hawaiian language. And then 1942, the following year, nowadays all kinds of races can be overheard conversing in Hawaii. I decided to lift these articles or the paragraphs from these three articles because it was almost too coincidental to happen three years in a row um, about this really important sort of social movement that was happening on the ground that I think is very absent from how we talk about and how we think about the Hawaiian Renaissance, whether that's the cultural Renaissance or the linguistic Renaissance. Um, and this is a movement that's predating the 1970s, 1980s by at least three decades. So it gets, um, you know, the plot thickens. And um, part of, of course, me, my pursuit to understand how people value Hawaiian language is um, tied to identity. And if these non-ethnic Hawaiians are, uh, there's enough of them to make it in the news three times at least um, for learning Hawaiian in a time when, at least for me, I thought, uh, you know, this is World War II in America. It was, not the time or place to be reclaiming anything Hawaiian. And I think that sort of shattered a lot of my, uh, my notions and my misconceptions. So uh, that certainly became a thread in this. So let's fast forward to the, actually what we identify and acknowledge as the Hawaiian Renaissance. This is a picture of the Kalama Valley evictions, uh, which Haunani K. Trask calls the match that precipitated everything that followed. Uh, it was the straw that broke the camel's back and really started the, re the Renaissance. Um, this, these bullet points here are actually what I, I took from, gosh, that must have been three or four years ago when I first started to frame this research and I presented it at, um, in my own department in the, linguistics department as a, as a seminar. And then I took it to Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, where I presented at a social linguistics symposium. And I just have to say that my uh, focus has shifted a bit and it's also become a, a lot clearer. Um, but when I was first thinking about language attitudes and um, ideologies surrounding Oleto Hawaii, I was thinking there are costs of surrendering, meaning nowadays if somebody does not want to, they have the resources available, they have the means, they have the time, um, but they still choose not to. They choose not to become a Hawaiian speaker or a heritage speaker or a new speaker or an L2 speaker, whatever you want to call that. There are all of these costs and these costs are significant. There's a cultural and a historical cost of being sort of, uh, not included in that in-group if you don't speak. There's a whole, there's, there's an entire history or a cosmogony of histories that you're sort of severed from if you choose, if you don't access that history via Hawaii. There's a genealogical cost, uh, intellectual and ontological. 
there's this interpersonal. Sometimes um, I see this tension of take two practitioner, cultural practitioners, for example, and maybe one has achieved a certain one identifies as a a little Hawaii speaker. And there's a tension that can arise between those two individuals when the practitioner who maybe doesn't identify as a speaker or who has um, just less mastery, uh, there's an interesting dynamic that can emerge from that relationship. And this uh, on, finally, of course, the intrapersonal struggle. And I guess the ironic thing about this is the cost of surrendering our A, B, C, D, E, F, and meanwhile, the cost of reclaiming are very similar to that. In let's say 2021, there are costs to become a heritage language speaker. Those costs are economic, it costs, even though there has been much work done in the way of um, community education and you know things like Duolingo, but that opens up a whole nother discussion that's beyond scope for tonight. But uh, I mean, and also the economic cost. I was fortunate to have parents that did not sort of question my decision to study Hawaiian language and major and graduate with an Olero Hawaii undergraduate degree. But I, uh, I can't say the same for a lot of my classmates and peers who said they were discouraged by their parents or someone in their family that, um, who asked them, you know, what are you going to do with that? My language degree, what are you going to do with that? Um, and there's that ties into a financial cost, uh, the educational cost of reclaiming these. Uh, this is a, this one's kind of an interesting one. You know, it, it comes with a great deal of sacrifice for um, if a parent chooses to send their children to Punanaleo, um, then, and sometimes those educational policies at Punanaleo, which is uh, technically a, a public charter school, I believe, or under that certain type of charter, which is different than maybe a, a different English medium public school and their educational policies, which is different than maybe a private school and, and its uh, individual, its particular educational policies. Uh, there's also familial costs um, when you're maybe the only sibling or the only cousin to become a Hawaiian language speaker. Um, and inter, interpersonal genealogical, which is uh, what we talked about also as costs of choosing not to, foregoing learning our language, our heritage language. So the costs are great on both sides and it really sort of becomes a uh, intimidating sort of um, web of emotions and sentiments and sentimental values um, uh, opinions, and that's really what attitudes are. It's where they, they manifest in those intersections. So um, these contributing factors to linguistic ideologies or language attitudes are sort of contemporarily, at least by researchers like linguists and um, I don't know, linguists and other scholars are, uh, th there are several. I listed a few here. There's a, this idea explained by Dorian that English is superior because of linguistic Darwinism. The, the mere fact that English still exists, it has survived. Uh, the survival of the fittest makes English the fittest. Um, there's also this idea that Nettle and Romaine um, talk about in a book called Banishing Voices, Linguistic Self-Defense. If you want to secure the future, the economic future and the socio-political future of your children, then you would shift to the dominant language to survive, to help them survive. So linguistic self-defense is a, a very strong uh, influence, bears a lot of pressure on 
and speakers of the minority language. Um, there's also this neoliberal ideology that says a, a commodity in the market. Hawaiian, a little Hawaii. I, I see this often. Um, I actually talk about it openly and frankly with my students um, at the university. You know, a lot of Hawaii. This is a it's a neat classroom to be in because um, it's not like learning Spanish. It's not like being one uh, in Spanish 101 or Mandarin 101 or French 101 uh, because all of those languages are global and none of them are threatened and none of them have ever been threatened and they probably won't be threatened in any near future. And they're also, those languages are not indigenous to this place. And for all the opposite reasons that makes Olelo Hawaii and you as an Olelo Hawaii student in an Olelo Hawaii classroom, very special and unique. And it's a, you're part of a bigger cause and you're part of a bigger movement. Even if you just signed up for this class for the grade and that's fine if you did, but, but being a commodity in the market has its, there's a, there's a dark side to that. There is a negative side of course, because uh, if something is a commodity or you know a novelty or something kitschy, it's it's attractive for now, but does that have any meaningful um, significance? And how does that commoditization translate in the the larger scope of things? Um, also in Hawaii, we are not spared this Euro-Americanist. Uh, Euro-Americanist ideals that Field and Crossgrady in uh, 2019 identified as uh, this one language, one nation ideal or norm that how can multi even how can multilingualism, much less bilingualism, thrive in a nation state that has this that not just has this ideal but you know sort of celebrates it um, to the extent that they do. And then lastly, Irvine and Gao identify these semiotic processes, these, uh, these the ways that uh, happen in society that privilege one language over another or subordinate one language under another. Um, and so I'm, work, I'm sort of working within all of these uh, as relevant to the case for Olelo Hawaii in, in Hawaii. And here we are in, in the 21st century where it has, it's just a, as um, sometimes as depressing it, as it is or as uh, um, discouraging as it can be seeing the way Olelo Hawaii is treated by some people, it's also just really the, the opportune time to talk about these issues. And the issue for me in particularly, I guess in this slide, at this time, this is this um, reality that the reality in which Olero Hawaii is used as both a target and a weapon. And those are sort of ideologically uh, polar, but for Olelo Hawaii, somehow Olelo Hawaii manages to be used as both. And what I mean by that, it's uh, used as a target for when someone like Kalekoa Kaeo is uh, choosing to represent himself using a co-official language of the state in uh, of Hawaii in a court of law. And he's, um, his absence is or his presence is denied just because he identified himself in Hawaiian language. And that's not the only case. You know, I've been, uh, like I said in the beginning of this uh, lecture, I've been in too many courtrooms where I've witnessed the sort of bold faced derision from the judge against people who have chosen. Olelo Hawaii uh, interpreters for their court proceedings, which is completely, completely uh, guaranteed as a as a human right. So, um, 
yeah, the fact that the the logic behind the judge's uh, dehumanization of Ka'eo in 2018, when this picture was taken, is that uh, I don't want to speak for him, but um, from my experience, it's been the logic is that people who also speak English but choose willfully choose a Hawaiian language interpreter are wasting tax dollars and you speak English as well. So just choose English. But the reason they're right is because they have nothing to do with capability. And somehow that's too often forgot by these folks who are entrusted to operate in this legal system and uh, uphold its integrity. Uh, on the flip side, Olerohova is often used as a weapon. And this really came to the helm and was fascinating, as well as just, uh, like I said, um, I felt pessimist. I felt pessimistic for the, the way uh, when the mobilization on top of Mauna Kea and Haleakala was really amping up and becoming a beautiful symbol of unity for um, people of Hawaii, Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian. Um, there were at least three instances that I actually can't find, I have a hard time finding them now, but at the time they were viral on social media. And these videos were, of course, when the law enforcement authorities roll in and they want to disperse the crowds of peaceful protesters, they would take the megaphone and they would give a, you know, two or three sentences, first in Olelo Hawaii and then in English, essentially saying you have five minutes to clear the area before we start making arrests. And um, that was just a, such a poignant example of the weaponization of Olalo Hawaii and it kind of came full circle, or I don't know if I wanna say full circle, but uh, it sort of reached a new egregious usage in this web of ideologies that we're talking about. Um, so let me check my time real quick. Okay, I think we're pretty good on time. Um, my actual research is I'll explain that in the next few minutes, but it was, it's basically oriented and informed by this question. How can community outreach and critical engagement oriented around discussions to resolve negative attitudes surrounding Olala Hawaii facilitate the revitalization movement? Can we talk about certain things that help us move forward? Can we talk about certain things that bring us healing? Because I often say attitudes are a lot like describing a new type of color that we've never seen or colors that we've never seen before. And also, so it can be hard to pin down. And at the same time, attitudes are linked to all kinds of feelings and sentiments and opinions and beliefs and trauma and shame and uh, a whole lot of uh, this bevy of negative emotions that are tied to those um, attitudes. So actually a lot of what this is, is finding some kind of healing, healing from that historical trauma. Um, so what I've identified as my methods and analysis is divided up into three phases. Currently I'm in phase one, which is ethnographic interviews. I intend to do about 20, but uh, 2020 last year, absolutely sideswiped my plans, but I'm not, I'm not the only one. Uh, phase two is survey collection, where I'll be basically taking a lot of the salient, pre very prevalent themes from the 20 or so interviews and uh, forming, formulating surveys or questionnaires and getting as many as, getting as many as, uh, as many responses as I, as I am capable of, the more the better. And then phase three, which is sort of what I wanna talk about mostly in the remaining time is this, proposing and implementing a model for community outreach and critical engagement. That's really what um, I'm really looking forward to. But um, 
a little bit about phase one and phase two. I am um, employing this theoretical framework that is described by Dubois in 2007, known as the stance triangle. When we're trying to determine linguistic ideologies and language attitudes. But actually I'm fortunate because a lot of this research has already been started, particularly on Hawaii by Dr. Christina Higgins, who is also on my PhD committee. She actually um, published a paper, an article in a journal two, two years ago called The Dynamics of Hawaiian Speakerhood in the Family. And she's looking at family language policy, whereas the parents um, essentially determine the language to be used among the family as a way of, um, as, as one method, as one strategy of language revitalization, because uh, it's identified commonly as very, very important to secure the home front, right? We're always saying secure the home front and um, where you have, where parents and families have the most autonomy. Um, it starts there. So uh, Dr. Higgins has uh, really made strides in researching dynamics of uh, Hawaiian speakers among families. But my ethnographic interviews are really, I was revisiting them this past weekend when I was preparing this slideshow and um, it brought me, it brought back a lot of memories. So um, one of the ethnographic interviews that I conducted already, I've conducted about six now and um, they're all so fascinating in the, the diversity of, of responses that I'm finding. Meanwhile, asking generally the same questions, right? Um, so one interviewee said that um, they feel more comfortable speaking in, in spaces where the other speakers, the other interlocutor, the other communicators are not there trying to make themselves feel better. They're not there trying to uh, show off. They're not there trying to belittle others who uh, are just trying to practice. And this interviewee said, uh, I don't feel comfortable in situations where I don't trust people. And she was actually talking about Mauna Kea and her involvement that there are, uh, there was such a different environment on Mauna Kea in 2019, when um, at sort of the height of the uh, mobilization in the Kukia Imauna movement, it was a, it provided for a wonderful learning environment. And this interviewee said she was not she regrets not having that same kind of encouraging environment in the university classrooms. Um, another one, so we see this sort of uh, in, interpersonal value, valuation or this intimidation factor that causes one person to feel less comfortable and to mistrust other people um, because other people are evaluating the other person's language and somehow it's not as good. And on the, uh, in an, another interview, it came up that uh, it was this sort of same struggle of valuation and not being good enough was completely interpersonal. This person was um, saying, I was judging myself super hard on myself and I still am. Meanwhile, nobody in the classroom her classmates, peers, no one ever actively, she says, I never felt anyone ever actively was judging me, but it was all her. Um, this one was really particularly, I think I'm just gonna read this entire thing. Um, this person said, but it's interesting about what you're mentioning about comfort and discomfort. So another place where I felt extremely intimidated only because of my own discomfort with myself was the Lumi Manaleo, which is where um, at UH Manoa, we have an office where um, Auntie Lolena and Auntie Ipo from Nihau can uh, sit with students 
any basically any part of the day pre-COVID at least uh, during the week and the, where uh, students can visit and basically just talk story with these Manaleo, these native speakers. Uh, but anyway, this person says, I felt intimidated in the Ului Manaleo because I felt like I had failed them. Like we were these, okay, this is our last hope. We're gonna try to save the language by taking these little kids and teaching them Hawaiian. And then here I am 25, 25 years later and I show up at UH and I failed, I failed. you. This is a speaker who was part of the first Punana Leo class. And when she later returned for graduate school um, at UH Manoa, she had this crisis of um, believing that she had failed Auntie Lolena, who was part of the, uh, who was her teacher 25 years prior in the La Hapuna Leo. So this was particularly heavy for, for us to, to talk about. So it kind of begs the question, is this effort, is the movement to revitalize Hawaiian language, is it a, of course it's a valiant, noble effort and a goal to which we shall all strive. But for some, it might be a burden. Um, and lastly, this sort of statement by one of my interviewees, I don't feel like beholden to anybody, like I got to prove something to and, and speak Hawaiian to be Hawaiian. That's not, that's just not me. I know I'm an enigma. And this stood out to me as uh, interesting because yeah, it is sort of enigmatic. Um, if we think of Hawaiian language as an identity marker and um, if we consider how many people do want to, there are various reasons for, for different folks to, to learn Olelo Hawaii. But for this person whom I interview, uh, speaking Hawaiian was just not a metric. It, it, it did not make them more or less Hawaiian. So is, uh, maybe I should have re rephrased this question. Speaking Hawaiian is probably inarguably part of identity, but how much? How much is uh, some competence in Olala Hawaii a part of uh, Hawaiian identity? But to what extent? Um, oh, one more. Another interviewee said um, they also came up through the Aha Punaleo system, the uh, Hayapuni system, the immersion school system to a certain age. Um, and then later on in life, when they came to UH and went through the university system, she said, and even though you can go through the system and be a part of that system, my language is still not like theirs. So another dimension of this, another shade of this, um, this uh, whatever behemoth that's creating a whole bunch of attitudes and ideologies is this sort of institutional variation, existence of institutional variations and this competition between them. And I cannot, I, I regret that I've been privy to this conversation myself. And um, I, it's sad to see the sort of institutional sort of rivalries and competition that still sort of exist. And, and I get it. There's politics involved, um, but I don't think this is necessary. Uh, I'm not sure if that's helping. So phase three, real quick, uh, sort of finishing up here. Uh, the phase about which I'm most excited uh, is designing and implementing this model of community engagement and outreach that looks like a series of workshops. And um, I still have yet to really nail down all the details. And actually uh, I was, I had a, a lot more details nailed down before COVID happened. 
and that's probably going to have to change in uh, life post COVID or life during COVID. But the purpose of these workshops will be to critically engage in discussions about attitudes, like I said earlier. Um, and the way I'm going to sort of track uh, positive or negative affect is by administering surveys or questionnaires before, during, and after. Um, I should say before, between, and after these workshops. And uh, I'm going to code the responses for trends and look for patterns in a positive affect about even just having a conversation about how you feel speaking Olana Hawaii or what's keeping you from speaking Olana Hawaii with your keiki or your family or that kind of, um, those kinds of responses are really what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, so that's phase three. It will probably gonna be, it will probably be further, further, further down the line uh, as, I, as I mentioned, but um, yeah, COVID sort of set me back at least two years, I would say, for this uh, data collection phase of my research. So I think that's it. Wow, I timed that perfectly. <laughs> here are my sources. I think I missed a few, but selected references are here. Shall I stop sharing, Bianca? How's that? Bianca, I don't know if you are on mute or not, but. I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> I was talking to myself. Thank you so much for that. Um, and everybody, please post questions either on Facebook or if you're an attendee, please post them in the chat. We have a few. Real, um, this one is from Kiana Renee, and um, she was, um, well, this is, she posted this kind of earlier in your talk. Do you feel those are the costs of perceptually denouncing English? Um, do you feel it, it, it that is um, the, um, the bans or um, on on Olelo Hawaii is designed to handicap the mental faculties of those who operate it. Um, and she expressed the belief that maintaining a connection to another language um, is a type of mental protection against damaging ideals perpetuated through English colonization. So, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm really interested in the the ban because. I don't know, maybe Bianca with your, um, your law background, you can say a little bit more. Um, I don't know if it's, I gotta phrase this really carefully because I do wanna acknowledge the, uh, the damage. And it was Act 57 of 1896 and 97 was terribly damaging to Olelo Hawaii and the speakership and the linguistic landscape. But um, Act 57 was don't use Hawaiian in schools. And it um, didn't say anything about don't speak Hawaiian at home. So the policy impacted the social stigma, absolutely. But um, I don't know. Is that sort of a typical to be interpreted as a ban? As a ban? I, I might, that's sort of. A, I realize it's a controversial question and a framework, but um, anyway, I, I'm. That was a, a big question that this person asked. Um, I probably lost. I probably spun out of control already. But I don't know, Bianca. Can you comment about? the legal frameworks? Um, yeah, my understanding was as well that it was a, um, a prohibition in the language of uh, public instruction. So, sorry. <laughs> um, 
can I, I have a couple more questions. Um, and this one is, Liana Wong and others have described the phenomenon of Kayapuni students and non-native language speakers reproducing English grammatical forms. How does that phenomenon play into the tensions you describe between parts of the speaking community? Well, Liana Wong is actually on my, uh, is also on my PhD committee. I respect him tremendously. And um, Liana Wong's paper uh, was sort of um, groundbreaking. And <clears throat> if we take it as a response to Cal Neesmith's paper, who is really criticizing um, Neil, this new variation of Oleta Hawaii that's basically emerged from environments of second language learners and how that just doesn't match enough, in his opinion, with the traditional, um, traditional forms, traditional versions that we find on the Ihao and Kauai and in small pockets still to, to today. Uh, so actually I would probably say Neesmith has a more of a problem in that deviation. They are too, they have deviated too far apart. I, I shouldn't say that, I said, I should say Olelo Kulanui or university or L2 speech, Neo-Hawaiian Neo as he calls it, has deviated too far from traditional Hawaiian. Um, whereas Liana Wong acknowledges that he acknowledges that um, there's a probably a difference, but who is who are we? Who is he? Who is she? Who is anyone to try and determine what's authentic or not? And his paper is fantastic in um, really proving that uh, authenticity is always um, it's all it can never be completely unbiased in in its determinations. So it gives, I like to use sort of those two theoretical frameworks, the, those, two, uh, those two papers really, as the two different poles, the two different extremes where one is saying it's too different, make it more the same. The other is saying it's different and that's okay. And sort of we're operating, or at least I'm operating, the way I think about things is somewhere in between. Um, but, and they give us, uh, they allow us to anchor to, to two different um, points on, in this spectrum that uh, sort of begin to explain how we, how we can um, rationalize that kind of, because actually it's a big, uh, it's a valid concern to be, one of the attitudes is, am I, am I speaking good enough? Do I sound, do I, I don't want to, I don't want to corrupt the language with uh, poor pronunciation or bad grammar. But um, I think it really comes down to, no pun intended, the attitude behind your, your, your intention behind um, your, your approach, really. It's, um, yeah, the approach is, is just so important. I'm, I'm kind of laughing because my intention is I'm, I'm going to try and read this. Uh, this is from Jacob Anthony Kalmuali Tekom. And if, uh, I'll post it in the chat in case I say this wrong. He has a question. I call you, I'm sorry. You oh. Oh, please, please, Kanani. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Ana, wa iki paha oe i ka manao o ka lāhui, ka poe Hawaii paha no ke kumukula, ke kulana kumukula. Um, I, yeah, I have not, um, uh, a few of the people I want to interview, uh, it sounds like this question is really asking if I delved into, um, the opinions, have I really sought to seek, uh, sought the opinions of uh, school teachers, immersion teachers maybe, or uh, public school teachers, private school teachers. Um, and a few of them are my, the folks that I have hoped to uh, invite for, to be interviewed are actually quite a few of them are, are school teachers because uh, yeah, that, that input and that feedback and those responses and 
and their perspectives are paramount in my research. So um, like I said, my the research is kind of on hold and delayed for now, but um, school teachers are absolutely uh, part of the demographic I'm hoping to hear from. I have, I think we have one more question and this is from Claudia in Paraco. What is your personal feeling about non-native Hawaiians who are moving to Hawaii and just want to learn and want to learn the Hawaiian language? Well, um, when was that paper? Um, Kaunoe Kamana and Dr. Peter Wilson, they have published extensively about the success of the Ahakuna Leo and Immersion uh, Kayapuni education program. And one of their more recent articles was published in, uh, saying that in uh, 1880, sorry, not 18, 1983, the Ahakuna Leo is established as an entity in 1984. They had their first school. And they, I think it's on the first page of their article, they say, uh, with one rule in mind, Eola Kaole Hawaii. So this is a really interesting, I'm glad this got brought up because if that's the only rule, then no rules are being made about any sort of racial criteria that, that people have to meet. There isn't um, this sort of ethnic kind of gatekeeping that happens in other uh, contexts of revitalization. There are actually uh, a few that I, I know about um, situations where an indigenous language is, is being revitalized and it has to be, I mean, the children, they are hoping enter their school or their immersion program must be of that ethnic heritage. They must have the, that blood. Um, so there are certain um, ethnic requirements. Uh, that's a great question though. Um, so for the Hawaiian kids, it's, it's never been uh, racially exclusive. And I believe the Maori case in Aotearoa is the same as well, but um, it, that might be part of the reason for it, for the respective successes we've had and the progress is the progress we've made, it's because it's it's not embroiled in that uh, in um, race and racial understandings and ethnic identities. So, long the short answer to that is. Um, anyone interested in learning is, is and should always be 100% encouraged and supported to learn. Yeah. Um, Kalani Bright, mahalo for sharing Kalani Bright. Ahuiho uh, ekui. Let me just respond real quick if we have some time. Kalani Please Bright. Do. Sorry, go ahead, Bianca. Oh, no, yeah, please, please respond. Thank you. Oh, no, I think Kalani was just sharing that he's um, had similar uh, situations of intimidation and, and maybe uh, negative reactions from other people and when they're trying to, I mean, basically this, I, I probably should have started with this, but if the idea is, okay, we've secured recognition from the state as, uh, as early as 1978, and that's, that's already belated, but at least we got it. Um, there, are, there is some, at, at least to the extent to which you can get a, a degree, and nowadays an advanced degrees in Olala Hawaii, there's some economic value. There are some value there are values to learning Olelo Hawaii, to speaking Olelo Hawaii, to identifying as an Olelo Hawaii speaker, according to both sort of uh, Hawaiian values and Western values. And those differing, a lot of times those value systems differ. So theoretically, we have it on, on paper at least. Um, everything is in, is in place for us to reclaim Olelo Hawaii across its entire functional range. 
And there are certain domains and certain areas on that, that range that fall short, where Olodahoe falls short. And that's really where I'm interested, what I'm interested in is if we have the political backing because of recognition, if we have um, a big social movement, you know, if well, some, the, the number is 20, 25,000 speakers that have achieved a certain fluency in Olodo Hawaii, that's a big number. Um, but meanwhile, people like Ka'eo and, and other folks are mm -hmm. uh, denied their self-representation in court in Hawaiian language or people, uh, they don't feel comfortable. People like myself felt scrutinized and intimidated for just being the interpreter. And those kinds of spaces that are sort of charged um, with that, with those attitudes, a lot of those attitudes are negative. Where does that come from? And how do we resolve it more importantly? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, and just um, this is from Tacom. I, I think we might have just to uh, clarify his, his question. It was uh, in regards to your research in the new PEPA, the opinions of Kanaka for school teachers in the Vakuiko. So I guess earlier stuff. Yeah. Was that in the, ch in the chat, Bianca? No, some of these are just on Facebook. I can. Oh, wow. Okay. But um, so I guess I was just to um, clarify his question. Um, but, and we also have one more if you're thinking about that one. Is there a correspondence between language competencies among Hakumele present and recent past um, and the language competencies in the Hawaiian language community? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Hakumele, um, you know, it's just so, so broad. We see people like many, you know, Mrs. Pukui began talking about, these are the conventions to write compelling poetry, Hakumele in Olero Hawaii. These are the uh, sort of, what do they call them? Um, literary devices that one could use if they, if they want to be poetic or to be, you know, so, but they're just, it's just so hard because it's such a, traditionally, the, there were so many different genres, different genres of language, different registers of language. So nowadays, if uh, um, there's so many different metrics and, and ways you could assess. I don't, you know, every year they have the, the judge who uh, evaluates the Hawaiian language performance or sometimes the Hakumele. I don't envy that position because it's so hard to, to really say what's, what's uh, strong and what's poor um, and where language comes into that, uh, language competence and uh, fluency. That's such a loaded question. It's a great question. But you know, hard to hard to say. It looks like we have time for one more question. Mana Cole, you put it into the chat if you don't mind reading it. If you're poised for Olon Hawaii to become to be a common language in Hawaii with your research in mind, what might you share to inspire person Kanaka or non-native uh, Kanaka or non-native to to seek the language? Um, yeah, great, great. Also, a great question. Aloha Manako, because um, like I said, mentioned earlier, Duolingo brings it to our fingertips and it's free and I, I don't, they have a certain process, a strategy and certain pedagogy in place that I don't know the effic efficacy of, but um, there are so many resources and we're really, really fortunate to be a part of this I, I call it, and not just me, I enjoy calling it among, as, as do other people, this legacy of literacy that our kupuna have left for us. And that is, it's a beautiful heritage to inherit. Um, and it's not, it's also not racially exclusive either. So we have so many open source archives and um, online 
uh, platforms and these online databases. Papa Kilo is one, Ulukau. So many books on there, so many uh, resources on there to, to really sort of just dive in anywhere. Um, there are night classes, there's adult school, there's, uh, um, oh gosh, a friend of mine, Kainoa and Bernati, I can, if I can shameless, do a shameless plug for his platform, except I don't know, we can, po we can post his, uh, the name of his organization later on, I hope, but there's, there are resources out there that Mauna hape, halau olelo, mahalo e kalani. Um, there's just plenty of resources that I think didn't, uh, that uh, take away a lot of the roadblocks that existed even 10 years ago. I mean, there's even just really impressive linguistic work, uh, linguistic analysis on olelo Hawaii stuff. Um, and a lot of it's free or very affordable. Well, thank you so much for this. If you have any closing thoughts, please, or. Um, well. <laughs> oh, mahalo, Kanani. Well, mahalo to you, um, to everyone, Bianca, Kanani, Lance, all of the attendees. This is fun. Great. And I hope you get a chance to look at the Facebook page. There's a lot of comments that weren't really questions that you might want to take a look at. They're very complimentary. <laughs> yeah. And, and also um, people will watch this later and they will comment later. So you're not under an obligation, but if you'd like to continue the dialogue, um, please feel free to check in on the video later. Um, so that uh, possibly people will post questions in the chat, not realizing it's not live anymore. <laughs> so. I would love to. I would love to. Um, I'll, go, I'll go check on that now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next month. Yeah, next Aloha. month. Aloha. <laughs>